fables in his own dissection of fables by relying on his own emotional intelligence and his profound sense of empathy. That are, those are skills that he has shared in his work that I've been able to take into my work and enhance my experience as a reader and also as a knower and as a perceiver. So I'm really grateful for the risks John takes in his works and the way he shows his own emotional intelligence. Again, as I said before, um, John is gonna introduce himself more fully. Once he's done with his talk, um, which I'm sure will be terrific, I'm happy to facilitate a conversation among us. I don't know, I think we end, I don't know what time it is there here. We end at 12.15, is that right, Kari? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm gonna just turn it over to John. I'm really delighted to be here and to hear what you have to say. Um, thanks again. All right, and let me reciprocate immediately because uh, Lisa Jean has been a big influence on me. Her work on urban beekeepers, the ethnographic approach there was is definitely, uh, example to follow um and and she just keeps turning them out you're hard to keep up with uh the catch and release book i, I recommend it to everybody as a sort of like uh example of what the old natural history can become kind of like social natural history and uh you know talk about risk taking get, get getting out there with our transgenic future and the spider goats you know exceptional stuff uh i enjoyed all all the papers uh and i'm looking forward to the ones tomorrow and so um I, i'm just going to jump into you know say a few things and i'm going to share my screen and i've tried to kind of keep this organized and um let me get into the slideshow mode and uh i'll kind of open with a, a bit of, of reflection on how i came to write about fables uh the aesop's anthropology book. And then I'm going to uh, recount for you a fable that I encountered in the field uh, fairly recently, uh, uh, 2019, just before COVID hit. And I'll talk, uh, you know, how I, I analyzed the fable ethnographically. And then I'll uh, conclude maybe the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to read from a, a, a manuscript. I, I'm writing a novel. And I didn't think I could write a novel and sort of I became an academic because I thought that I didn't have that kind of imagination. Uh, but what I'm doing in the novel is working from folklore sources and tapping into fables. And so I, I think it's a, a, a resonant example to kind of uh, you know, frame some of what's at stake here. So the Aesop's anthropology book, I, I wrote it at, at this very transformative moment. Um, in 2010, I started doing field work, and I, I shifted from working in the U.S. Um, on race uh, to working in Mexico and in Spain. And instead of focusing on humans, I started focusing on plants. So uh, that's a pretty substantial uh, series of shifts. What helped me a lot was uh, reading Eben Kirksey and Stefan Helmreich's multi-species ethnography article in Cultural Anthropology. It's the first time I got a journal in the mail and opened it up and just sat down and read an article all the way through. I was like, wow, this is great. So um, uh, what I encountered uh, in doing field work at Long Abio, uh, it's a, a, a genetics lab in Mexico, uh, you just kind of turned everything on its head for me. They were talking about razas de maiz, races of corn. And of course, immediately assumed that, oh, you know, they're trying to naturalize race and this is, you know, taking the human version and projecting onto the, to the corn. And then I had to do um, historical archival research in agriculture. And I found out actually Rasa starts on non-humans. It starts on horses and dogs, et cetera, and then gets carried over to people. Uh, and as I'm kind of going through this drastic rethinking, reorientation, uh, all of these terms that I'm familiar with for race, indigenous, uh, native, et cetera, I realized, oh, wow, it all started on plants. And, and hybridity, something I had been kind of um, schooled to value highly uh, by cultural anthropologists, actually comes out of botany. Like, wow, okay, wait a minute, you know, all of my analytical language here is, is full of botany. And, and that's probably because there's something very fundamental about plants that I, I haven't quite comprehended. So I 
I end my days as a social constructionist. Um, I, you know, I, I had this moment where I was showing, uh, I was doing a lecture on, on, on Lange Bio and you know, hear all these races of corn and, and they say they're 64 or 33 and blah, 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 blah. And I realized I, I couldn't say anything at all about the species itself. I couldn't say anything about the difference between highland varieties and lowland varieties. I said, like, okay, I'm missing something very fundamental. Uh, and in terms of, of this morning's discussion, it's basically when I quit worrying about anthropomorphism, uh, because I, I realized it's it's profoundly anthropocentric. Uh, the ethologist uh, Franz de Waal says the bigger problem is anthropodenial, uh, the denial of commonalities uh, with humans and other species, uh, drawing the golden golden barrier. So um, by the time I, I finished this ethnography that um, I, I used. Aesop's anthropology to kind of think through, I, I, I shift from studying what the scientists are doing, the botanists, to say, okay, can I use the botanical analytics as a, a, an ethnographer? And, and Christoph Lange, you know, give, give you a great rendition of that with the species, species local. So, uh, you know, I, I won't go into a lot of detail about, you know, what I worked through in that book, but I do want to emphasize why I was a, able to do this work. And it, it's largely because of the influence of, of one of my mentors, Donna Haraway. And um, in particular, you, you know, prior to Companion Species, uh, she wrote Modest Witness at Second Millennium, Female Man Meets Anko Mouse. And, and what I get from that work uh, is you know, her attention to, to figural realism in techno science. Figural language, figural images, figuration generally. I think that that's a fundamental impulse behind fables. And what's valuable of, about taking Haraway's theorization is, is we can kind of expand out the frame of what the fable is. Uh, and then most importantly, see their forms percolating up through the very current cutting edge work of geneticists, and I'm sure you know, Lisa Jean could you know talk to the, to uh, to this. So her method, um, you know, it, first you call attention to the figures, the stories that are in the domains of techno science, and then think about how those link to other desires and materiality. So you know where I would have started out, kind of like, all right, you know, I'm going to deconstruct science as full of fables. I ended up like, well, no, Haraway retains a very fierce commitment to evolutionary perspectives um, and science. She wants to recuperate it to generate more reliable accounts by you know, attending to its figural di dimensions. And so because of that, uh, you know, you know, when I started thinking through the fables, it, it wasn't to simply deconstruct their appearance in science. It was to actually kind of, oh, all right, well, here's how you account for that. And then in addition, work through their techniques for um, uh, analyzing species. You know, basically, you know, the shift is, you know, seeing this uh, proliferation of, uh, of, of floral metaphorics and not settle on, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna do an ideological analysis here because it's naturalizing these things, but then to say, well, you know, what are the commonalities? What are the forms of sameness? Uh, and and how do we bring them into, into view? And basically the, the answer is homology. And this is what natural scientists do when they're developing evolutionary accounts. They, they figure how parallel forms in other species develop e either from you know, shared lineage directly or analogically they were generated uh, by similar uh, sets of circumstances, may maybe different solutions in it an adaptive sense to them. Uh, and so and it's hard to do that if you're you know principally concerned with anthropomorphizing. Um, so in the chapter on, on fables as form, I say, okay, here's here's species thinking. This is what the fables do. And, and you all kind of know this and we've been talking about it this morning. So I certainly won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, the misrecognition of you know species relative uh, capacities, et cetera. Um, the perspectival shift from from the wild ass who's looking at the oxen in, in the field and you know who has it better 
Um, and, and, and the very fraught line between wild and domesticated, that's quite a, a prevalent concern in the Aesop stories. And then fundamentally, they say, you know, how do we transmit experience, observation, and thought? The fables have been excellent um, cultural forms for retaining over a couple of millennia uh, these really uh, clever observations uh, about other species and how they can uh, you know, speak to us. So, so, so the following chapter in that Aesop's book is like, oh, wait a minute, model organisms, when geneticists are working with them, they are a lot like the fables. Uh, and, and the basic economy here is that we can't know all the species. There's just far too many of them. It's too challenging. So they select, you know, three or four and they, you know, standardize them through breeding, optimize their storage. Uh, and then much like the fables, these model organisms then are selected to be representative in depicting life processes. You know, gene interactions, certainly, but also, uh, you know, most prominently, uh, social characteristics that uh, are, are prevalent among mammals and that might might be a basis for understanding human sociality. And, you know, much like the fables, they operate to, you know, transfer across species line, you know, some sets of knowledge. All right, so, so, so that's the theory stuff, got it out of the way. Let's go back to the field. And, um, um, you know, following the care of the species, ethnography of the botanical gardens and, and, um, and, and maize breeding in Mexico, I moved on to uh, do an ethnography of horses in Spain. Um, and I, because they're highly social species, I was able to transpose the analytics of cultural anthropology. And I was able to do so because uh, I have excellent colleagues in anthropology, the primatologists who are very well versed in doing this. Um, and so following that, I started working in Latin America. Uh, and the idea was to uh, do a study of uh, bullfighting in, in, in Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. And I, but, this was a project that got killed by COVID. Uh, you know, basically I started in 2018, got in one more round of field work in 2019, and then, you know, COVID hit, and Peru in particular was uh, just massively slammed, and I wasn't able to go back, and, and by the time I could, you know, the moment had passed. Um, but uh, what I've got for you here is uh, uh, a glimpse of, of, of the spectrum of, um, of bullfighting in Peru. And on the left, this is in Celandine, and this is in the north of Peru. And um, uh, they every year they build from scratch this wooden arena uh, that's got about you know, four floors, holds 8,000 people at least. And they very studiously try to recreate the Spanish style of the corrida of the bullfight. So you'll see here the procession, uh, the aguasiles and Gary, I'm sure you, you recognize a lot of this. And so the, uh, on one hand, trying to adhere very diligently to the Spanish version. What you see on the right is where I, I was working in 2019 in the south of Peru. And this is a corrida and it's, it's radically different. Uh, so kinship is front and center here. Uh, the two kind of clusters of people are, uh, you know, the two big families that were sponsoring the Corrida. Uh, and, you know, indigenous and Andean are kind of lunky terms to use here, but certainly in contrast to, to, to that Spanish style. That's what, what, what you see on display. Um, and then, uh, you know, very importantly, um, this arena. It's built at the foot of what was an Incan platform. That's the big structure you see in the background. And on top of that, they of course built a, a, a little church. And, um, uh, and then you see here this arch, this arch over the doorway, and there's a bull on top of that. And that is Tarazona. And Tarazona is this fabulous bull that is the center of the fable. Uh, but you see them performing 
uh, the kind of you know classic style of Toriar with the cape, but also um, there's these ribald moments, these carnivalesque moments where a bull gets loose uh, and you know runs around, and everybody in the arena tries to uh, cape it, and you know women in particular get to come out and play a role here. So uh, it, it 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 vacillates between kind of, of reenacting the Spanish version and then also making fun of it and you know, rendering it as something indigenous and local. And, and most importantly, in, in this corrida, they don't kill the bulls. Uh, that was the, the case in the corrida, the bullfights up north, uh, at least up to the 1980s, and then the bulls become killable. And that's a, a long story that I'll, I'll get into. But um, uh, once again, I'm back, you know, thinking about race. And uh, with the bulls, uh, Costa is the term that's characteristically used for the Spanish breeds. Uh, this is a bull whose lineage can be traced back through generation. Um, and it's, it's cultivated to be aggressive, bravos, uh, it would be, you know, violent, it, 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 dangerous. Um, what I became very interested in was uh, when they started talking about vacas nativas in Andagua. And, and I should go back here and say for a moment that um, uh, I worked in this region with one of our graduate students, Alex Meneker. He's an archaeologist. And, and so he was you know, working on all the Incan infrastructure. Uh, and, and he told me about the bullfight. I said, OK, I've got to come down, Alex, and check it out. Well, he, he invited me. Um, and so uh, he and I start uh, talking with people, people who are working with bulls, you know, and you can't quite call them ranchers or breeders. It is, but they would use the, this term, uh, native cows, and the cow is not native. The cows came with the Spaniards. The, the cow is an agent of imperialism. Uh, and yet locally, they were making a, a set of claims about these uh, native cows. So um, what we analyzed together is Turupukyai, and it's a uh, Quechua word, and, and, and Pukyai means play, and I'll get into some of that um, etymology in a minute, but, but Turu is their alliteration of Toro, so you know, playing with the bull. And so, so Taromachia is this very refined um, art and regulation of the Spanish style bullfighting that you saw meticulously being reproduced in that opening slide. Uh, Turupukiai is what they're doing in Andagua. They're, they're playing with the bull and they do it uh, in multiple ways. Uh, certainly through the kind of burlesquing of the corrida that I showed you, but also you're saying that there are these vacas nativas, these native bulls, uh, which breed with the Spanish costa bull and then create this media costa. Uh, and so here's where I'm gonna get into um, the fable. All right, so one quick thing before I get started. Well, what's a bull? So here are two bulls, but they're completely different creatures. So, so the bull on the left is indicative of bulls in Peru and in the agricultural cycle. They're used for plowing. I took this picture at uh, an open air market where they're selling livestock. And uh, you know, notice the little kid on the left hand side, just kind of sauntering past. And I've got you know so many pictures of like little old ladies tugging the bull, and the bull is going along. All right, da, 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 okay, whatever. In, in contrast. The bull on the right is a Costa bull, a Toro Bravo, and, and he is bred to be violent and to attack. And you know the central tenets of, of Taromachia is that the, the Costa bull cannot see a human on foot prior to the bullfight. Um, because he, he's got to be confused by that. You know, previously he's just seen bulls on horse, I mean, humans on, on horses. Um, and so he doesn't know what's, what's going on here. But um, these are both bulls, uh, but completely different kinds of characters. And you can well imagine the bull on, on this left-hand side exactly being used in Turupukya, you know, brought in to be caped a few times on the weekend, and then he's back to plowing the next day. So Tarazona, and this is the fabulous bull that they 
told me and Alex about with great enthusiasm. So here's a picture of the arena. And, and you'll see Plaza de Toros, very traditional kind of characterization, El Terrazona. So this fabulous bull is emblazoned. This is his arena. And, and it was him carved up at the top. So um, I said, well, tell me the story. You know, the, the like basic ethnographic question. Tell me more. Tell, tell me more. So as Alex and I interviewed uh, you know, local ranchers who worked with bulls, and we're asking them about the history of breeding, the Spanish bulls, et cetera, they all got around to this story at some point. And it was a dark and stormy night. And, 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 and this local cow, Vaca Nativa, gave birth to this marvelous uh, you know, bull calf. And, and they don't know who the father was, uh, but it was probably a Spanish, you know, Costa bull passing through the area. So the fascinating part is that the owner's son, the owner of the Vaca de Tiva, raises the calf and teaches him how to bullfight, teaches him how to, to go at the cape. And he, he gets out a Victrola and he puts on the Paso Dobles, you know, the like you know, the classic bullfighting song. So, 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 so the bull gets used to all of this. Um, and then when he finally comes to fight in the arena, well, he knows all the tricks and they can't kill him. Uh, and you, you know, he, 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 he's violently a, a, a aggressive to the bullfighters, but then this you know, drunken woman chaotically walks into the arena and he, he calms himself, very composed. He realizes you're know, non-combatant here. Well, a bull that fabulous is gonna be very popular and people want it. And so se several guys try to buy the bull to go fight. And, and they buy him, but they can't get him to leave the valley. You know, things go wrong. And, and so finally, one person says, oh, we have to perform Tinkai, this propitiation of Pachamama. Once they, once they do that properly, then the bull can leave the valley. And he goes to Toriar in, in the next big city, the Rocco. And, and, and he wows them there. And, and they can't kill him either because he knows all the tricks. They said, wow, we got to take him to Lima. Lima is, is, is the epicenter of, 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 of Tarumakia in, in Peru. This is the grandest arena. And he goes there and he tore so well that the, the crowd applauds. Oh, this is marvelous. What a marvelous bull. Send him to Spain. He must go to Spain, Spain. And so you know, he does quite successfully. Accounts as to whether he's finally killed in the end uh, vary. Um, one of our informants insisted that no, he was just put out to pasture. So, so here's this fable, right? And uh, you know, what do you do with it? Well, one of the guys we talked with was this elite breeder, uh, and he's totally removed from the everyday life of the guys that we were talking with. He's your, your classic kind of mestizo elite, and he's like, "This is bullshit. Don't believe it." This is something illogical. This is not possible. This is not not possible. And he, you know, very funny guy. He, he, you know, he's quite invested in this. He wants to bring Tarumakia to Andagua. He wants the people there to crave the Costa bulls and see them killed. And also, you know, for for the kind of tourism that that'll bring. He wants properly bred bulls, properly trained toreadors, and um, you know, he's played a role in this. And he said, okay, listen, I believe in the Virgin Mary, okay, yes, but I'm a geneticist and I don't believe in this bull, but this bull has believers, Arizona. This is something crazy, it's illogical. Uh, so, it, it, you know, the like, principal idea is, is that the bull is killed uh, because the, if, if the bull is let to live, then he knows the tricks and in the next corrida, he will ignore the cape and he will go and he'll kill the Toreador. So, so you've got to kill the bull. He says, okay, well, maybe this bull made it to Morocco, but there's no way he got out of Lima alive, and there's no way you're going to take him to Spain. So, all right, so this kind of counts as a fable because it's impossible, basically. Uh, and yet, you know, this is a, a very powerful story that people tell. So how do I analyze it? I said, well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because it inverts the history of bull breeding in Peru. Uh, and it makes this claim for the status of, of the vaca nativa. So where the bull um, uh, you know, goes from Spain to Lima 
to Morocco, it inverts that. Well, this ball goes from Morocco to Lima to Spain and is triumphant in doing so. So it's reversing kind of the Spanish conquest. And very importantly, it, it mirrors another ball, another fantastic ball, a, a fable um, in the novel, Yawar Fiesta. Um, Jose Maria Arguedas was a um, cultural anthropologist, but he also uh, worked as a novelist. He, he wrote as a novelist and, and he, ha he has a very similar story. And in both of these stories, the kind of history here is this moment when you see cattle ranching expanding in uh, the rural areas of Peru, which is most of Peru, in the 1920s and 30s, you know, people are being displaced by that, uh, being pushed further and further up into more uninhabitable stretches in the mountains. As well, the government is undertaking this mission of civilizing the peasants by teaching them proper spectatorship. Uh, so, you know, very similar um, structural mythic dynamics uh, around both of these bulls. Um, uh, Misitu, in the end, is dynamited by the communeros who refuse to, to succumb to, to this notion of uh, proper spectatorship. Uh, Terra Arizona meets a much better fate. So as a fable, uh, what I, I, I argue is we can see the figural power of Turupukiai, this you know, broader uh, array of burlesque, um, and um, you know, tr transformation and inversion. Uh, it, it, it's sort of all kind of in encapsulated in this fable. And importantly, it catches these breeders up and their cattle uh, in, in these very rambunctious senses of what's possible locally in overturning tauromachia and in inverting it and playing it to the point where it becomes a burlesque. And it, it's very deeply disturbs this very serious reader who is like at pains to say, listen, don't believe this story. Don't believe it. So it's that powerful that he, he feels threatened by it. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up this you know, section here, but with this quote, and, you know, so one of the guys we talked to, and, you know, they all told the, you know, you know some version of Tarazona, but he said, okay, you know, that, that story I've just told you, it was told when I was a child, and we played bull. Among the kids, I would say, I'm Tarazona. No, I'm Tarazona. We're all Tarazona because he was an exceptional bull. He was that good. And, and that's exactly what Donna Haraway is talking about, which is the figural power of, of language to make it a story that, that you can inhabit, that you can you know, orient yourself in and the world around you. So that's an example of an ethnographic analysis of a fable uh, that's you know, very current. Okay. Um, for various reasons, I've, I've ended up writing a novel following Arguedas and other, you know, cultural anthropologists who, who have a tendency to make this, you know, veer. Um, and it started when I was doing field work in, in, in Northwest Spain, in Galicia, Galicia. And um, there, there's a lot of, of Celtic traces there, the resonances. And it, it's very complicated because the Celtic identity just very overwrought, but it's there. Um, and, and, and then um, I happened to be in Galway uh, in, in 2018, the following year. And I'm like, oh, well, there's the Spanish arch oh, and the Spanish arcade, and the Spanish parade. What's all this Spanish stuff? <laughs> and then I'm off and running. So um, let me kind of frame this for you. Um, the, there are a lot of fabulous stories about the Spanish Armada told in Ireland. And the principal one um, is of the Black Irish. So the, the Irish, you know, generally very fair skinned, uh, but you have these you know, you know, black haired folk on the west side of Ireland. It's probably from the Vikings. You know, that's what, what's been borne out recently from G genetic analysis, but there's this very powerful story. Oh, it was the Spaniards who came ashore. And um, you know, I found multiple versions of this as I started doing archival work. So I started digging into ethnographies uh, in Galicia and Ireland, and it, like, I came across one in the 1860s, you know, like a folklore account 
ethology. Uh, and they're like, oh man, these these people in the Cladig, this fishing village, they all look Spanish to me. They all look Spanish. So, you know, this is, it's got a life of its own. And, and, and I even found a version of this with, with the horses. Uh, so uh, the Connemara pony is sort of the distinctive breed in Ireland. And they will tell you that um, there was the native horse. And then um, when the Armada jettisoned its cavalry, the, the horses came ashore and started, uh, you know, reproducing with, with, with the locals. So there's lots of layers. Uh, to this, a lot of historical theorizing about links between Spain and Ireland, okay? and they go back millennia, frankly. Um, and you know, it, the Armada as a military endeavor really played off of a lot of this um, imagination. So uh, King Felipe said, "Oh, we're going to invade Ireland as a distraction," and you know they had in 1580, and they did it again in, in 1602. Uh, but the novel kind of works through what's happening for uh, the Irish who are involved in this. And there are, are some pilots, Irish pilots, who served in the Armada. Um, and you know, one Spanish historian theorizes the ones that wrecked in Ireland were piloted by the Irish. And you know, just for a moment, a context. Uh, so in, a, in the span of about 10 days, in September of 1588, uh, 25 Spanish ships wrecked on the Irish coast. Galleons, and, and galleons are really comparable to the 747. You know, it, it was the most sophisticated machine of the age, carried about 350 people. So, you know, picture two dozen 747s crashing in, in Ireland. Uh, you, that's the scale here. And you know, the historical, sources are almost entirely unreliable because they're English and, and English, oh, you know, we got in, we killed them all immediately. Uh, but you have all these Spaniards turning up um, in various places over the next uh, you know, couple of decades. So the only way to get at this, you know, what's happening here it, it is to do it novelistically. Uh, you know, I just can't get at it any other way. So I'm gonna read a, a passage. And, and my method in this novel is to draw on a lot of folklore sources um, and you know literature like uh, the Decameron and stuff. So what the characters spend a lot of time doing is telling each other stories. And that's how I work it in. And, and so these stories, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking them from a lot of sources that, you know, people just don't read anymore or you can't access them or whatever. And I'm trying to kind of recuperate them in the service of this kind of challenge of, of, of trying to think about well, what happened in this moment in Ireland uh, when all these Spaniards landed. And basically, you know, my thesis is that they overlapped enough culturally that you know, some of them were able to fit in. So um, I'm gonna read this opening section. And what, what I wanna highlight is it's almost entirely drawn either from this folklore book, the People of the Sea uh, from the 1960s. Uh, and this guy, David Thompson, he, he, he was like um, not an academic folklorist, but he was very interested in the folklore. So he went around and collected it in Scotland and Ireland. And then the the uh, the other you know, counterpoint here is, is a, a story, The Soul Cages. And, and this is very complex to, to trace out. It was purportedly collected in the south of Ireland in the 1820s. But one of the people who worked as a collector claims that he took it from uh, the Grimm brothers. Um, and you know, he may well have, but it also seems to be the case that people there were already telling that story that he thought he fabricated. Um, and Oscar Wilde tells a version of it. So I'm gonna read about five pages. And this is from the first chapter of the novel. Uh, and to set it up, this is in Galway, uh, and um, the opening pages is this woman, Asling, who's a major character, and um, she's been up on the bully. The bully is where the women take the cattle in summer to pasture them, um, but uh, very ominously the, that morning in milking the cow, strands of blood came out, and she's up. Somebody's going to die, and it's probably my husband. 
uh, because my husband's been machinating against the king of the seals. And, and, and so from the people of the sea, I, I get this concept, the king of the seals. And it was an attribution of kind of potency to, to the largest, biggest seal, you know, what, whatever species, they had a king uh, and it, it kind of ruled over them. So um, what the seals would often do maliciously is tear up the nets of the fishermen. Uh, and so her husband, Diarmid, is settled on the king of the seals as being the problem. So she's kind of rushing down to, to get um, a hex on him that, that will keep him from drowning. She arrives too late and will pick up the action uh, from the point where um, the perspective shifts from uh, what she's uh, been doing, you know, her trip uh, down to what we see then um, uh, on the um, water. Now, I'm going to just read this, but you can follow along. I'm not going to do a dramatic reading. I'm not going to do, do dialect. I, I don't have that skill. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Past the reach of Asling's vision, Diarmid is setting an ambush. Off the tip of the promontory that shelters the Cladig from the ocean's worst wrath, Diarmid's boat is treading on the cusp of the receding tide. Canal and Fion are lolling the oars, steadying it in place, while Diarmid, the bow in the bow, readies his nets and rope. The Pukan, full with the day's catch, mackerel, rides low on the waves. It's a fool's errand you have us on this evening, Diarmid, Canal complains. Each passing moment, Fion adds, makes more of the tide for us to work against. Diarmid is having none of it. Quit your carping and keep us steady. We won't have far to go, and hardy lads as yourself are well up to the task. Not that it will convince them, he adds, for their comfort, we'll have a good sea breeze at our back for another hour or two, I warrant. Diarmid prepared well for tonight. He has a newly made seal net, weighted just right to drop quickly over their heads when they break the surface. But as he tugs at its stout mesh in the bow, Conal continues to grumble. The king of the seals must be an awful size. Think how hard we'll have to fight to get him on board. Just get him close enough, Diarmid assures him, excuse me, so I can smash him in the snout with the oar. They'll kill him quick. Then we'll haul him in easy. But how do you expect the rope to be strong enough against his might? Diarmid smiles, fingering the horsehair rope he has knotted to the net. I braided this rope myself, late into the evening on many a night. There's no stronger rope than from horsehair. He'll not be snapping this tonight. The pukan rises and dips gently on the slow rolling waves. The half moon's glow shimmers on their low crests as they tumble along towards the rocky shore and finally break against the promontory. The distant sound of the surf against the coast is all they hear for a long time, a long moment. Then again, breaking the silence that descended upon their vigil, Conal ventures. Where is it that seals come from? Diarmid shares no thoughts on the subject. So Fiona opens up. I've heard they're the souls of drowned men. Who told you that? Barks Diarmid dismissively. Sheepishly, he answers, Iriel Kelly. He told me so when we were watching them playing back and forth in the current off the beach one morning. Bah, he's speculating is all. As the boat bobs in the night, the question lingers. So can I suggest, I've heard they're fallen angels. Waves slap aimlessly at the prow as Jeremy responds. If they are, that makes them the devil's minions. And there may be truth in that, the way they tear up our nets just for sport. Not even to eat our catch, just to torment us with their frolic. Silence sidles in again amongst the men until Conal presses on the matter once more. Sure, they're like us though, with their eyes. How they watch what's happening. They have our gaze too. They study on things and how they hold their little ones when they give them the breast. What do you want about now? A deeply annoyed Jeremy demands. Sure, they are like us, Fionn supports Conal. And that's why Keoptri Feeney says he won't hunt them no more. He used to, you know. He, and he has pelts to prove it. But one day he was hunting them in the caves of the north and he got one corner real good. And he was just raising his club to strike her in the face, strike her dead, when suddenly the seal cried out, Kiabri Fini, in our own tongue. Hold your wrath a moment, she pleaded, while I give the breast to my pup one last time. Well, sure he couldn't strike her after that, nor any of her kind ever since. 
Kiabri Feeney, the Armand Sniles, always has an excuse for why he's no good at fishing or hunting. That's why the dirty bugger is left to cutting peat and thatching roofs for Hiram. The men fall quiet again as they, as they feel the current turn more heavily beneath boat. The blades of their oars stroke the sea in slow, deep passes, steadying the pecan on the tidal turn. Then at last, just as Jeremy predicted, the seals arrive. After feeding on young mullets in the shallows of the harbor, they are riding back out now in the strengthening current. A few dark snouts break the surface, then dip and disappear again. But they begin to cluster and pop up all around the boat. See, the Armid whispers, they're curious, wondering what we're about, wondering why we're drifting out here with no nets in the sea, nor an anchor stone dropped. He stands tautly in the bow, scanning the surface. Then the Armid sees him, bobbing up curtly, one head far larger than the rest, emerges and regards them deliberately. Limpets are crusted on his cheeks, and droplets run down his long, silvery whiskers, dribbling back into the sea. The king of the seals. By Christ's bowels, Konal grounds. He's bigger than a boar. Dermid makes his throw. Quick as thought, straight and true. The king doesn't react, just stares hard and long at the men. Then, draped with the net, he dives crisply. Dermid winds his horsehair rope around his right forearm and tosses the tail end to the other two. Hold on, lads. It's going to take some doing. Sure enough, the rope snaps taut, reverberating angrily as the king, enshrouded in the net, abruptly reaches its end. The line goes slack a moment, then wham! He surges forward again under the surface, testing its strength. The rope drops slack once more, then explosively tight again. Jarman smiles. The horsehair braid is up to the task, and he senses the repeated lurch of the line, a feel of desperation in the king's failed efforts. His strength will waste quickly, he assures them. The three men clump together on the boat's starboard side, leaning back against the gunwale, their bare feet bracing on the large planting of the bottom of the pukan, waiting for his next burst of effort. Kanal is uneasy and reminds them, careful now. Sure, he's clever as any sinner. In the end, it's the stoutness of, Dier of Dierman's rope, horsehair rope, that dooms them. For indeed, the king of the seal cannot break it. Realizing this, the king decides to reverse course. He quits pulling with all his might and swims back towards the boat. Then under it, the men watch the rope droop and loosen, floating benignly on the water. Hold tight, Ted, lads, Dermid demands. He's trying to trick us into relaxing our grip. That's only partly true. The king indeed tricks them, but by taking advantage of how they have set themselves against his strength. Gliding up from underneath the pukan, he surfaces on the starboard side, against which the men clench for his next effort to escape their clutches. They hear him snorting as he breaks the surface. But before they turn around, the king launches himself upward, planting his flippers and the great weight of his barreled chest atop the gunwale of the boat. Reeking of musk and sea rack, whiskers bristling and gleaming like needles in the moonlight, black eyes glaring, murky breath spraying in the night air, the king bellows his displeasure and heaves downward with a vengeance. In a moment, that side of the pukan dips under. The port side tilts straight up in the air, exposing the beach, the beach keel to the starry sky. The men lurch backward into the sea as the boat capsizes. The shock of the cold Atlantic is not their biggest peril. As they tumble overboard, their sturdy vessel lifting up and toppling above them, the men find the mesh of the seal net tangling with their hands and feet. The king easily sheds its fetters now that it's closing around the thrashing fishermen. Their woolen shirts and breeches saturate quickly and become leaden on their flailing, desperate limbs. Dermid, Konal and Fionn fight mightily to no avail. And as the burden of their sodden clothes and the well-weighted net tugs them further from the surface, the pack of seals mutely assemble in a circle to watch their final struggles. The men thrash ferociously a little longer than their efforts stall and still. The seals look on fascinated as the rhythm of the land departs their bodies and they are given over to the rhythm of the sea. The gentle tug of the waves and current now commands their drifting lifeless limbs like stalks of waving seaweed. As the seals gaze on, from the depths, a mermaid rises, hustling quickly to the scene. Her grass green eyes glow with excitement, and her tail of silver and pearl whips vigorously against the brine. She has in hand, trailing behind her, a clutch of crystal globes, each stoppered with an enchanted ademony, cultivated in her underwater garden. The mermaid swims up first to Dermid and places her emerald hued palm against his chest. With the webbed fingers of her left hand, she tickles his throat. 
His corpse coughs once and spits out a bright blue ember that wobbles about in the chilly current, currents, bewildered and adrift, adrift. Quickly, she uncorks the first globe and ushers it in, stopping it with the anemone. Stuffed like a tiny tankard in the bottle's neck, its vigorous tentacles start to tingle and writhe, enlivened by the incarcerated soul's eternal radiance. The mermaid does the same in turn with the drifting wrecks of Conal's and Fionn's drowned bodies, and each involuntarily releases its soul to the enticements of the seawater maiden. Pleased with her catch, she flips around and descends from whence she arose, and with that, the seals disperse and resume their journey home for the night. And that's the end of the first chapter. So I'll stop there. Wow, John, thank you so much. That was, I, I, one thing that was amazing was just your delivery of the whole talk was so wonderful and lively and passionate. And I just got so much out of it. I wanna just open it up for any questions. I have a few prepared, but I wanted to see if other people have things they want to ask or discuss or talk about with respect to the talk that John just gave us. All right, could I jump in with a bullfight nerd? Yeah, of course. Um, I was intrigued by <clears throat> you know, that middle piece about the fable of the bulls and that creation of, as it were, professional bulls for the bullfight. And if you ever get back to it, I wonder if there might be another little theme hovering here. Looking at that picture where you had the bull button, the, as it were, the formal bullfight to the left, Mm -hmm. um, I I am guessing that those bullfighters are not local. They've never fought in that arena before because they're not wearing their hats. They're carrying them. Sorry, it's a real nerdy thing. Um, no, it's the one right. before that. It's the one before. Yeah. Yeah. In the procession. Yeah. I, well, you, <laughs> sorry. And, and that's, yeah. That's yeah. So yeah. I was going to add that maybe what you've got here is is you've got these professional bullfighters from outside coming in and professional bulls coming in. And on the other side, you've got the carnivalesque, which is the locals where the, where the professionals take no part. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, and, you know, excellent eye and, and, and you're right. So, so uh, you know, I, I gave a kind of very brief rendition here. Um, there, there is a major transformation underway in Andagua. So um, what you do see, in this part of Peru, are, are, are professional bullfighters brought in, but but they don't kill the bull. You, you, that's kind of the stipulation. Uh, and and so um, what what happens in this event is it's held over two days. And so so the first day it's mostly the professionals, uh, and then the second day it's it's the local guys. Um, and and so um, uh, the, the, then what's also you know happening here is. Is that some of those rancher guys I've talked with are are you know breeding these more aggressive bulls so they can you know fight more often, but they're also like not so aggressive that they're uh, that they pose a threat to the professionals. But it's not clear that they can hold the line between you know all the forces driving driving for greater pro professionalization. So that uh, that elite breeder. Alejandro, uh, 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 two years before we got there, he donated um, several of these, they call them media costables on the stipulation that they would be killed. Um, and uh, they were killed by pro professional fighters. And you know, so this is his effort to, to get the tastes in this village to, to change. Um, you know, by and large, People prefer the version on, on the right, where, where there's big familial processions and, and the bull gets loose and there's chaos. Um, you know, but it, and it's not clear which one's going to 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 win out. So yes, I, I would like to to go back in a year or two yet and, and see where where things stand out because that it, you're exactly right. It's on the cusp of of transforming towards a more pre professional event. And I, you know, I should say as well, and you know, before the epi epidemic, um, more people in Peru attended bullfights than did soccer matches. You know, and soccer is enormously popular. So you know, that increasing popularity is 
affecting these more remote kind of, of local versions. Um, and it's, you know, an open question of whether they can in, endure. Yeah. Thanks very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> Can I ask a question? I'm curious. Um, so in writing the novel, one yeah. thing that was so compelling about the story you told was just the voice of the speaking subjects. Yeah. And I'm wondering what time period this novel set and how was it through the folkloric work that you got the language and the pacing and the cadence of how people talk? Or is it from anthropological yes. work? currently so i'm just curious about that yes yeah thank you thank you it's it's from the folklore so so like that book the the sea you know the people of the sea i got like like not exact quotes but those kind of phrases you know certainly the the topics that they were talking about came up and uh and this guy was a very good folklore he, you know, he, he would hang out in the kitchen and describe the kitchen setting and and the cadences you, you the pace at which you know, people come to to voice these really challenging ideas. Oh, they're they're drowned men or fallen angels, and always that tension over credulity. You know, like can we really believe this or not? Um, and so I'm extrapolating backwards. Um, and you know, I, I, so 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 the actual period is 1588. Um, part of my basis for extrapolating is uh, from the prior ethnographic project I did in Galicia, Spain. Uh, now that ritual is documented to at least 500 years ago. Uh, so the the ritual where they gather up the, the horses and shave off their manes and tails. So um, I was able to work ethnographically in a historical frame that's, you know, parallel to the moment that I'm dealing with in the novel. There, there remains a lot of open questions of how far back you can take ethnography, ethnographic observations and say, well, this is probably what they were doing in 1500. Um, but when you have like folkloric sources that like you say, you, you can hear a cadence to them, you, you can see a, a very common set of concerns. Uh, it, it's probably a reasonable basis to sort of project that back. And the other thing is, um, so uh, th there's a very fraught moment historically in Ireland. So the, the English had, had conquered the south of Ireland um, and they began the process of extermination that would you know, lead to the plantation system that they developed in Ulster and then transported to the Americas. Uh, and, and so this part of Ireland is on the border uh, and, and there's very much a lot of racialization going on and, and you have, um, you know, the dominance of Christianity, but also uh, a lot of vestiges of paganism, which sort of get reanimated by the Gaelic chieftains in this area as their argument against the English saying, oh, you're just savages. They're like, no, you know, we had this, you know, mythology, this culture, uh, you know, so in a lot of ways that was getting reanimated and brought into tension with Christianity in that in that region, as well as so so like Galway was an Anglo Norman settlement, you know, the Normans came in, and and many of them sort of went native, you know, became Irish. So when the English show up, they're the new English, and suddenly it's a problem because the new English are also Protestants. And the Normans are Catholic, so it's it's a very fraught uh, historical moment. I, I'm I'm glad you raised that question because I, I didn't really you know frame that well. Great, Matthew. Did you have a question? I just saw you come to life for a second. Okay, um, Kari. So what well, Mark is thinking about, Mister? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's great that because like your story of it the sea like uh, resonate with the, my grim story, both about like, uh, inter like interacting with water and the magic and, and talking animals and so on. So I, I really have to think about the material to fish nets this time as well. Uh, <laughs> my question is about the homology. So you you talked about the homology in, in terms of the fables, but I wonder, do you make this distinction between analogy and homology in relation to fables. And I wonder, like, uh, are they different for you? And if so, like, uh, 
how does it sort of corresponds to different kind of understanding tables? Yeah, uh, so, so the thing about homology that I learned, uh, it was while I was doing field work in the um, herbarium in Madrid. Um, and um, so, so, so the botanist language uh, is one that's shared with the uh, literary theorist type homology analogy. And all this comes from uh, Wolfgang of Goethe. Goethe. Uh, he, he articulated this set of analytics and it hived off in one way in the natural sciences and another way in the humanities. So uh, it's it's not that you know the humanities version of homology is derivative, but but it developed in in rather different kinds of applications. So what I've gone for with homology is um, you know being very influenced by evolutionary analytics to to say well, with with homology the 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 lineage connection is direct. We 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 can trace through you know primates and then up through the chimps to humans and say okay you, you know these kinds of, of features uh, are shared in, in common. We're like you, you know um, uh, you know birds develop kind of a, a hand like structure the claw, but it's an analog to the human hand because it's it, it's got a different evolutionary trajectory, but they look kind of similar. So um, that's what I mainly rely on uh, for uh, for talking about that, and you know, so, so like you look at at horses, um, you know, we share a great deal of musculature, facial musculature with with the horse. It's obviously different morphologically in terms of overall size, uh, but you know, at, at about sixty five million years ago, horses made the same choice as we did. You uh, to evolve towards this savanna, uh, and so on the savanna you, you need height, you need the eyes, you need the ears, etc. And, and, and so their evolutionary adaptations that become familiar to us are analogous. You know, it's not from the same lineage, but but that's where you can see the the advantage of evolutionary theory. So you know, it, I can talk about that with horses in in a way that you know I I couldn't with goats, for instance, you know, do, do you different genus, et cetera. And so, you know, the point being, you can make more reliable uh, co uh, comparisons if you have uh, homology as a frame or analogy and you're thinking, well, evolutionarily, how did this happen? And recognize that it, it's fairly limited, you know, those kinds of, of, of very close parallels. Right, so, so homology is to recognition with uh, something evolutionary. Similar. Yes, yes, yes. You don't yes. use that for spiders and so on. It's going to be analogy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Stuart? Yeah, th thank you for that. It was, it was great to hear. And, and it was actually, coincidentally, I'm, I'm talking about tomorrow about stories from Orkney and Shetland about selkies, seals that metamorphose into to human form. Um, so the question is partly kind of in connection with that. And certainly in, in Orkney and Shetland, there's this whole, you know, stories about selkies are part of this much more extensive repertoire of various kinds of beings who inhabit the, the sea and, and shoreline. Um, and you talked about this a little bit with reference to the, the mermaids coming up to collect the souls. Um, so I was kind of interested, to what extent do you see, in the case of the, the west of Ireland, this kind of fully imagined ecology of different kinds of, of beings connected with the sea or with the, the undersea world? Um, yes. And also, how, how do, do the human dead fit into that? Right, the, these the guys on the boat, obviously, their souls are being taken down. Uh, yeah. One of your reference points is the wrecking of the Armada off the west coast of Ireland, where obviously a lot of crew are now physically at the bottom of the uh, um, of the sea. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of interested in in how those might form part of a, a kind of larger storied yes. ecological yes, imaginary. Yes, yeah, great, great, thanks. For the question, and, and I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow. So yes, you, in the west of Ireland, very developed cosmology about the undersea world, uh, and so you know it could be like the single mermaid merman 
one of the stories I use later in the book, there's this whole underwater city of the Mer people. You, you, there's a separate sphere of sociality. And, and it's interesting because um, um, uh, in this story, uh, outside of the city uh, are all of the, uh, the drowned humans uh, and they're howling away in, in, in the wreck. And, it, and it, it's this horrible experience for the uh, human who's taken down there. Um, they, there's a lot of, of theorizing about drowning. Um, and so in Ireland broadly, uh, and this is how the, the like novel opens. So all of the rivers, um, they're, they're female deities associated with, with, with them and each one was drowned, drowned in a different circumstance, you know, uh, drowned by a father, drowned by a, the well of knowledge overflowing, you know, drowned trying to escape a lover, you know, just uh, so, and then in drowning, she becomes the persona of the river and, and gains knowledge through the through the process. So she so she becomes a transcendent entity in, in a way that you know the drowned sailors don't. Um, uh, at, at the end of the novel, I return to to this problem of the of the mermaid and the and the men's souls. And and so um, the kind of central um, uh, you know, pair bond that forms up is between Asling, uh, the Irish woman, and Aneko. Aneko is, is a Basque whaler who's you know, on the Armada. And the Basque have their own tradition around mermaids, which is actually you know, more interesting in some ways. Um, and it's pretty clearly linked to you know, when women got displaced from the church. Uh, that they were kind of imagined it did have these powers because they can you know, find gold. But uh, the the like um, the Basque mermaids they need human women to serve as midwives when they give birth and to attend to them when they die. Um, and you know so that's a very different elaboration than anything I, I found in Ireland. So so Aneko is going to at the end of the book summon his Basque mermaid lover from the past and bring her in to <laughs> contend with, with the Irish mermaid. So it's gonna be Basque mermaid, Irish mermaid, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. And looking forward to tomorrow very much. Do we have any other questions? Gary? No, you're just twiddling your pen. Okay. <laughs> um, other questions or thoughts or ideas for conversation? John, I'm wondering if you could just also speak for a minute, just because um, you and I had a prior conversation to this, and it just got me thinking of yeah. your own professional stakes in writing yeah. a novel, and yeah. what are some of your maybe anxieties or yeah. thoughts about that? I thought it'd be fun Thank to you. kind of share a little about that. Thank you. It's an anxiety-ridden affair. Um, you know, so like, you, you, you know, when I first got the glimmer, you know, that was in 2018. So, you know, I was, I was like, well, you know, I'll save this for when I retire, you know, and, and I'll get to it. Yeah. And, and so I would, you know, kind of squirrel away folk tales in Spain and, you know, and then, I, you know, basically the pandemic hit. And I'm like, well, you know, shit, why don't I work on this? And, um, you know, as I, I, I mentioned jokingly with uh, uh, Stuart at, at the very beginning, I, 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 I have a book under contract that I'm supposed to be writing now. Uh, and it's called Social Theory for Non-Humans, and, and it's it, it, it kind of completes what I see as the trilogy of my multi-species ethnography. So, you know, uh, ethnography in Spain on plants, ethnography on horses, that here's the theory book that explains, and I, I can't wait to write this damn thing. I'm, I'm really excited about it, because it'll be explaining evolutionary theory to people in this in the humanities, but engaging evolutionary theory with our dialogues as well. So I'm very excited about it, but very gradually the novel's kind of taken over. And so like, I wouldn't say anything. I, I would just like, I, you know, how, how's the book coming? Great, it's going really well. I'm working very hard on it. Um, you know, and then um, um, as I was doing my annual report a, a year or two ago, I was like, you know, you know, going down the criteria and there's like, oh, artistic production. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this might count. <laughs> you know, so like I've, I've got this long file, you know, rationalizing how it, it's 
it's an intellectual undertaking. And and the kind of dirty backstory here is that you know when I joined the anthropology department at the University of Texas, we had five subfields and folklore was the other one, and and I killed it. <laughs> cut it off, um, you know, for a, a variety of reasons, uh, you know, we were, you know, getting, uh, you know, applications from like white kids who want to study the blues in Mississippi, and you're like, oh, God, really, you know, come on, you know, if that's all folklore is, let, let's not do it, and we, and we tried to update it, cultural form is what we came, came up with, uh, but I'm like, wait a minute, actually, there are ways of engaging folklore, Um you know, and 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 making it, it you know reach an audience in it, in a different kind of way. So uh, there's a, an intellectual rationale here, and you know I go back and forth between how uh, articulately I try to spell that out and think about you know I might write something about that. But you know, frankly, just emotionally, it's like a lot of mood swings. You know, like you know, some days I'm like, oh yeah, this is the right thing to do, and other days I'm like, oh, this is a horrible mistake. Uh, you know, and, and the worst thing about making a mistake of this size is you have to let it play out all the way. You know, you, you can't just say, oh, it's a mistake and leave it. You're like, no, it's a mistake I got to stick with until the very end. And hope I love that, that. It's not I, hope, a I hope someday you'll write about that, too, because I think that would be fascinating to read about. Um, Susan. Thank you, John, for sharing something that I know it's super hard to share creative work. And I think, um, you know, just understand that all of us are, are nervous for you and also really celebrating this too at the same time. Um, you raised a really interesting question as you were talking about it there that has been on my mind since Kauri even lofted this idea of the animal fable to me, and that is who the audience is um, for animal fable. And so disciplinarily, you kick it out of anthropology, it gets kicked over to me in literary studies, and it gets kicked over to sociology or wherever else it lives. Um, yeah. But it does live and it does persist. But it is interesting that it has that kind of um, hybrid genealogy unto itself and intellectually. Um, but that brings me to a really practical question, which is who are you thinking of as the audience for your novel? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And I'm unclear about that yet because they have a hard time getting people to actually read it. You know, like I'm begging my kids, I'm begging my wife, please, please, please. Like, oh no, yeah, no, come on. <laughs> so so right now there's not much of an audience. You are it. <laughs> you are it. <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 um, here's an interesting matter. You know, for, for, for it to get an audience, it needs to get out of academia. And, and that is very difficult to do. So uh, like I, I need to get a literary agent and, and and you can't get a literary agent until it's entirely done as a manuscript. They, they won't even think about it. Um, and I have a prior horrible experience with agents. Uh, so um, my book on, on Barack Obama and the national conversation on race, uh, what can you say? This was from 2008. Um, this was a book that um, I, I started as uh, ethnography of media it, 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 it was race stories in the news over a year uh, from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day in 2007 to 2008. You know, Barack Obama wins you know, South Carolina. And it was all the stories and like how they got framed and how people decided it was racial or not. And then I, I came up with these four kind of feature characteristics of the conversation on race. If, if there's a comment, a remark, a racial remark, Americans will talk all day is that racial or not? You know, we won't talk about incarceration or you know insurance or banking, but you know, remark. Anyways, I was like, okay, this is great. I've got really vivid material. It's all media based. It's current stories in the news. Let me find an agent. You know, and um, I, I went through a lot of uh, kind of training and working to you know develop a pitch. I, you know, I talked with academics who had done it, read some good books. I ended up contacting over 70 agents and not a single one expressed any interest in the slightest. None, zilch, nada. So it's an academic book. So, you know, I've, uh, I'm already kind of putting out, you know, little feelers here and there, you know, and somebody knows somebody and uh, 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 Chris Kittrell here at uh, UT Press says he's kind of interested in reading because he sort of knows an agent, you know. So it's like ah, you know, it 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 that 
very kind of basic question is going to be hard to answer un until the very end. Um, and, you know, I'm just not sure um, what else to do. You know, like I, I picture these various audiences, um, you know, like I, I, I like, I'll, you know, I'll sit in, uh, in front of the TV with, with, with it off, with, like I'm doing dialogue. Cause like, I'm trying to picture actors on the screen, you know, the screen's blank, but I'm like, you know, how would they, you know, say this, read this, you know, so like, I'm thinking, you know, popularly, but uh, I'm stressed. Gary, do you, do you have thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, let me give you a suggestion because I've just spoken to them fairly recently. Go and look at Bloomsbury. Okay. Bloomsbury okay. are doing really interesting range of books and a colleague of mine has just written a thing about marathon runners, again, full okay. of interesting content, but for a general audience. And they were looking for other books. And I said to this agent from Bloomsbury, yeah. um, how can you afford to be so imaginative and move out into this other world? And there's one answer. Harry Potter. <laughs> and they so take that's... all of that money. They've taken a huge amount. And I think you might be able to make an interesting pitch to Bloomsbury. Go and see what they're publishing now, man. They're, they're, right. they're really pushing the boat out on things. So that's exactly what I was just about to say as young adult. Um, most yeah. publishers don't know what to do with animal stories anymore, if they ever yeah. did to begin with. <laughs> and mm -hmm. what they do is slap on the label of young adult. And it turns out that that crowd is receptive to it. And um, I only teach undergraduates. So that's how I'm able to sort of keep a laser uh, eye on what's happened since the Harry Potter thing. But they're really, really into magical creatures. And I don't know, I mean, we could speculate, I'll listen to the anthropologists about this. It might mm -hmm. be escapism because of climate doom. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's a lot, I think, to be said for some really powerful work out there right now that is um, succeeding despite that young adult label, but for marketing, I think your publishing people are going to want that too. I'm sorry, yeah. Susan, I was making a slightly different point, although they have that side to them. Um, they are, they're looking for uh, stuff for a general, you know, we used to say the person who reads the Sunday Times, the, the, the Times Literary Supplement, and Michael gets his book reviewed there, is a very different move for them. Um, and they're taking on ethnographically based stuff, environmentally based literature. So, um, so I wasn't thinking it's because they made money on Harry Potter and young readers. They want to invest more in that. They're not. They've really spread their money out into history, anthropology, sociology, criminology, literature. That's a great lead. Thank you. Michael, who? You said Michael's book? Oh, um, I'll send you his name. Um, um, ooh, he's a lecturer at Durham. He wrote a book about um, Ethiopian long distance runners. Okay, okay. And, and Isabel, thank you for your suggestion in the chat about the writing conferences. Yeah. Um, I, I thought about doing some of these, these online kind of, you know, history writing uh, workshops and, and agents are often kind of you know, lurking there. And I sort of figured you, you, you know, once I get some stuff you know, where it's really polished, um, uh, you know, I might try to, you know, join one of those and, you, you know, see, see what pops up. So, so, so thank you for that su suggestion. Um, so I think we reached the end of our time. Thank you so much again, John and everybody for a really great conversation. I really was grateful so far and I look forward to seeing you guys again.